As your elected sheriff, and with the benefit of 36 years of Maryland law enforcement experience, I feel it's my duty to inform you publicly of a few of the very dangerous pieces of legislation making their way through the Maryland General Assembly in Annapolis this year. Misinformed progressive politicians have introduced legislation that if passed will change policing and public safety in a negative way for years, if not generations to come. Make no mistake, if these bills are successful, I have no doubt crime reductions like those we have experienced in Harford County for six consecutive years will be in jeopardy, negatively impacting the safety of our communities, innocent people will lose their lives, and you will worry about sending your children to school. To be clear, no one wants bad police officers on their force or on our streets. To be equally as clear, the processes, tools, and laws already exist to allow police leadership to fire those officers who should not be in service to our communities. Stripping away a proven due process system is not police reform. Being a police officer in America is a tough, lonely, and sometimes thankless job. However, your law enforcement officers put on a uniform each day and do the job because they believe in service before self and the benefit of law and order to a free society. Without order, there is no society. So, what is so concerning? We'll start with legislation that will defund state support for school resource officers and completely remove them from our school buildings. Unbelievably, this is actually on the table. Some legislators refuse to give up, these same legislators refuse to give up the protection they are afforded in Annapolis by armed Maryland Capitol Police officers behind metal detectors and in committees and on the floor by armed state troopers. They support all of this for their safety, but don't feel our children deserve the same level of protection. Next, a measure to repeal the police officer disciplinary process that has been in place for almost 40 years known as LEOBR and used by all Maryland police agencies. They want to replace this with a boards of civilian activists with no experience, understanding, or expertise in policing who will make decisions on discipline applied to seasoned officers. If this is such a great idea, it's curious that these same legislators don't want to have the same, this same novice and uninformed oversight process for their members accused of wrongdoing. In order to sell this program as a need for police reform, supporters of the effort have demonized the acronym LUBR and repeat some variation of the same narrative. Why should police officers have special rights when they commit a crime that citizens do not? This is simply not true and is nothing more than a red herring. Police officers charged with a crime have no more or less protection or rights than that of any other citizen. They have the same rights we all have and protections guaranteed in our Constitution. Additionally, legislators have proposed bills, a bill, to allow habitual drug users the ability to become police officers. Under this reform, an applicant can show up the day of testing, smoke a joint on the front steps of the police station, and apply to be a police officer in Maryland. Is this the candidate you want coming to your home in your time of need or responsible for your family's safety? Another bill proposes removing police leaders and police experts from the state's uh, Training and Standards Commission and replacing them with civilians who can have no connection to law enforcement. It's the equivalent of taking experienced and qualified surgeons and nurses off of medical training boards and replacing them with a the lunch lady. God bless the lunch lady. She has an important job, but just not the medical expertise that is obviously required in this example. Again, it is being proposed, once again, uh, to make it illegal for us to cooperate with our federal partners and forcing us to release criminal illegal immigrants, some of whom are MS-13 gang members, back into the community. Another bill allows for greater public disclo disclosure of police personnel records than is allowed for any other public employee. Our own Senator, Bob Cashley, who has been a staunch supporter of law enforcement and has been attempting to bring light so much to this harmful legislation, worked to amend the bill to make the same standard apply to, Maryland, to the members of the Maryland General Assembly. As I'm sure you can imagine, this is another good for them, but not for us concept that was shot down on purely party, a purely party line vote. Under the banner of independent investigations, some are proposing removing your ability to hold your police leader accountable. As voters, you place your sheriff in office and can remove the sheriff if displeased with his or her performance or if he or she has lost the trust of the public. 
taking away the elected sheriffs, a constitutionally elected officials, ability to investigate police involved shootings in their counties and bringing in an outside police agency with no commitment to our county and our citizens, blindly turning these cases over completely removes my ability to ensure a complete, thorough and transparent investigation is conducted. It also removes your ability to hold someone accountable as you have no say over some state bureaucrat or outside agency chief or sheriff. Having an outside agency conduct these investigations doesn't make things better or more transparent, but it can certainly make things worse. Another bill, if passed, would see police officers charged with crimes for discretionary acts while performing their duties. This is not to be confused with charging a police officer who commits a crime during the course of their official duties. I don't know of a chief or sheriff who opposes that. This is not what that bill does. This is an attempt to make crimes of split-second decisions required of our police officers and who are operating in good faith. There is obviously a national, there is currently a national crisis in police recruiting and without a doubt this will lead to fewer men and women choosing a career in public safety and a hesitancy on the part of your law enforcement to act in emergencies. I will end this list with the removal of qualified immunity for police officers. The naysayers will have you believe this protection currently in statute prevents police officers from being held financially liable for acts committed while in the course of their service to the community. What they won't tell you is that qualified immunity does not exist if a police officer commits a crime uh, or acts committed with gross negligence. Qualified immunity exists to protect good cops from frivolous lawsuits and the removal of this protection will also result in fewer men and women looking toward a career in service and a step backward in proactive efforts. It is again telling that the same legislators pushing for the removal of qualified immunity for police officers would never entertain giving up this same level of protection for themselves. Make no mistake, this is simply another red herring and more depolicing through the destroying of the profession a piece at a time. Sadly, this is not an all-inclusive list of what is being proposed, and to boot, all of these changes are being rammed through a secret COVID session of the Maryland General Assembly, where unlike normal years, testimony and citizen input has been limited. Some legislators understand full well what they are doing and, in my opinion, are ill-intended with these efforts. For others, they are simply misinformed or uninformed of the facts. This is what I like to refer to as my McDonald's theory. I suspect that we can all relate to the experience of sitting in the drive through line at your local McDonald's and thinking, what the heck's going on back there? Why is it taking so long? They should do it this way instead. Why don't they just do this or that? In reality, we don't understand all the experience training, reasoning, processes, and procedures involved in what is a very proven process of delivering prepared food to an unending line of consumers within seconds of ordering. In reality, and I think we're all guilty of it, we think we could do it better, but we really have no clue how it actually works, and sadly, this is the perspective too many of our legislators are operating from. To close, I want to again be clear, as your sheriff, I'm happy to work with our elected leaders to make policing better when and where possible, and to also build on our collective efforts for more transparency and community engagement. That is exactly what we've done the past six years. But unfortunately, that is not what is being attempted through these legislative proposals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Sheriff. We have a lot of comments coming in. But let's start with a question. You talked a lot about your concerns with proposed legislation under the um, banner of police reform. Can you talk about proposed legislation under that same banner that you do support? Absolutely. There, like every year in Annapolis, there are, there are good bills mixed in with some of the bad bills, um, and some of them under the banner of police reform. Um, I sit on the uh, legislative committee work group for the chiefs and the sheriffs in the state, and for the past six years while I've been sheriff, we've had input on so many bills uh, in support or in opposition, always looking to make our profession better. Uh, but some of the bills this year under the package of police reform that I think are good bills, uh, there's a bill in to mandate body cameras for police departments within a few years. Um, that is something we have pursued here at the sheriff's office. Uh, we've had it in our capital request the last three years. And uh, this year, the county executive has committed to funding for the program and we are going to be implementing a body camera program here. So I, I think our, we've had a, a pilot program for a couple of years 
the deputies like it, the citizens like it. So it's a it's, it's a great thing, and it adds to the transparency with our community. So I think that's a good bill. Um, standard use of force is another area um, where right now every police department can come up with its own use of force uh, policy. We have a very thorough use of force policy here at the sheriff's office, one that we have reviewed and updated several times, consistent with um, legislative efforts, with best practices, with court uh, decrees, uh, keeping uh, ahead of current events and the best practices in policing. Um, but every police department can institute their own. So I do think if it's a good policy, a standard use of force policy across the 140 or 150 police departments in the state of Maryland is a, uh, a good effort if it's done correctly. Uh, subpoena power for the chief or sheriff on administrative investigations, not criminal investigations, they are distinctly different, but on internal matters, administrative investigations, uh, the chiefs or sheriffs have never had the ability for subpoena power. And I think that's in one of the bills that would allow the chief or sheriff to get uh, gather additional information on those cases to hold police officers accountable when and where necessary. Um, and there is a proposal for a statewide database of police officers who have been terminated from one agency uh, and um, not be able to be hired by another agency, uh, something that would be maintained, I believe, by the Police Training and Standards Commission um, if they've been fired or even forced to resign in lieu of termination. And I think that's a good thing. I've unfortunately, in my time as sheriff, had to have let a few people go. Um, everyone who starts here at the sheriff's office, uh, here's my uh, please don't make me fire you talk on the very first day and we fire people for uh, serious violations and if they're uh, not up to the standard here to wear a badge uh, I stand in front of our fallen heroes uh, memorial here at headquarters um, if they don't want to live up to the reputation of the men and women on the wall behind me and the 247 years of this agency um, as far as I'm concerned if they don't have a place here they have no place in policing and I support that thank you sir the next question um, is asking for your thoughts or position on Baltimore City falling under the authority of the city of Baltimore rather than the state of Maryland. It continues, it says, as you know, this is proposed in police reform bill, House Bill 670. Yeah, I, I have heard a little bit about that. It doesn't really affect us here in Harford County or in other agencies. Um, I have known uh, several of the commissioners and, and several people in the Baltimore City Police Department. Uh, I, I don't think it's I don't think that the state has really had control over the Baltimore City Police Department. As far as I know, all the commissioners have been hired by the mayors and uh, um, confirmed by the city council. Uh, I have never seen the state uh, interposed in that or involved in that. So really, it's something that doesn't apply here. I wouldn't take a position, support, or, uh, bat or opposed to it or in support of it, but it doesn't really seem to be... Um, a factor, you know, obviously what Baltimore City and what police departments need to focus on are reducing crime, and I don't see it to be a factor in that. Uh, we have another question asking if you can just further explain um, what is wrong with civilians judging police departments. Um, I, I think it comes down to, again, the McDonald's example I used. Um, we, we have a serious business. It takes uh, six months of, first a six-month process to get the, the applicants in the doors to become police officers and it takes a little longer than a six-month police academy to teach them everything that they need to do to teach them everything they need to know um, what is proper what is improper what case law is what the constitution guarantees you know there, there's so much that a police officer needs to know on the street and then they need to be able to take all that information and the training that they receive year after year, the updates to the training, the changes in legislative processes, and be able to implement that within a matter of seconds. And then someone to review that process. I, I think it should be individuals who have that experience and expertise and can look at it through the same eyes as the person um, involved in, in the complaint or in the process. Again, we don't have, we have doctors or nurses over seeing that profession because the average citizen like me has no idea what is right or wrong in an operating room or in, ass in an assessment of a patient so i just believe a citizen i'm all for community involvement we've grown it greatly since i've been sheriff over the past six years here at the sheriff's office i just don't think that that uninformed role is the proper place for a civilian input uh, we have a citizen that's asking, how do we protest or attempt to block these bills? 
Well, certainly, you know, reaching out to your local legislators um, is the first step. Uh, we are going to uh, share a list of the bills, the, uh, the bill numbers and the sponsors that I spoke to, um, spoke about uh, a few minutes ago in the comments section here. So if you want to reach out to the uh, exact uh, delegate or senator who proposed the bill and, and speak with them about your concerns in, in support or in, in opposition to it, um, or, you know, go right to the top. You can call the Speaker's office uh, or the Senate President's office in, at the Maryland General Assembly, uh, and you can find their information on the Maryland General Assembly's website, which I guess we can also share uh, in the comments below. We're having questions asking about losing the rights of criminals but making it harder for um, a law-abiding citizen to get a gun and limiting Second Amendment rights. Uh, I don't think it'll come to a surprise as many. I'm, I'm a staunch uh, Second Amendment rights supporter. Um, I believe our citizens should not only uh, they have the right to keep and bear arms, uh, but I believe, you know, unless there's a reason to restrict them from that right, you know, they should actually be allowed to carry it. To, it's a control uh, process is currently controlled under the Maryland State Police handgun permit. Um, I, I, I'm all for us to be an open state because when you need to protect yourself, the police officer is not going to always be there, and most of the time is not going to be there. Um, but certainly, we have seen legislation year after year that is implemented to reduce what they call gun violence, which is really criminal violence, um, to reduce uh, to reduce homicides in our state. Um, and year after year, that legislation f fails be fails to have any impact because it does nothing to address the criminal behavior and just outlaws a tool. Um, so I'm in Annapolis usually. The COVID session again has changed things, but I'm usually in Annapolis testifying against bills that I think are in violation of the uh, Second Amendment. Um, but yes, and, and several bills this session are much more friendly to uh, the criminal and less friendly to the police and want to make uh, criminals out of our police officers. So I hopefully I addressed that question adequately. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, and, and again, if you could just continue, we have some additional questions to talk about the difference between um, a jury of your peers and a criminal act and a police disciplinary um, board. What's the difference? Well, certainly, if you're charged with a crime and, and our forefathers gave us the process um, under the Constitution and in the Maryland Constitution for how we're going to hold uh, people for in, in, um, to account for violations of our criminal laws, uh, the administrative process is is completely separate and distinct from a criminal process. So when you hear people complaining about, uh, you hear certain uh, representatives complaining about LEOBR, that process is purely administrative, applies nowhere in a criminal investigation. Um, so again, I, I think when you're talking about violations of administrative policy violations, the best people to judge whether something was right or wrong in those circles are by uh, are people with the experience and the expertise and the training uh, to have walked in the, those footsteps before to make those decisions. When you get over to the criminal realm, um, the agency still may take administrative action, but the criminal is going to be handled completely different and LEOBR does not apply. That's the last question that we have up, sir. Certainly okay. a lot of good comments and discussion. I think that based on the comments that are coming in, people found this helpful in understanding some of the proposed legislation. Do you have any closing thoughts or comments? No, again, it's just, uh, yeah, I, I'm proud of the work that we have done over the past six years, working with our partners at the federal, at the state and at the local level. Um, we have seen six years of crime decline in Hartford County. Uh, something I'm, as sheriff, I'm, I'm very proud of our men and women for you know, leading that charge. And uh, again, these bills go the opposite direction of that. And I don't feel as an elected sheriff that I can sit back and not say anything uh, and let these bills go in unchallenged because they are going to make things different for our community uh, and less safe. And again, I started this a couple weeks ago with a posting that we put up about the school resource officers. Um, I, I, I don't understand the logic behind them, but I do know from 36 years of being in this business uh, that all of this stuff is not police reform. All the stuff we spoke about is not police reform and only serves to make our community less safe. Well, thank you so much, 
um, for doing this with you, our viewers this morning, sir. Um, for those that didn't get to watch it in its entirety, we will leave this post up on Facebook so that you can share it um, and, and view it in its entirety. Thank, Thank you, so you for much. joining us.